morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Jareth, and, and on behalf of the Division of Allergy and Immunology, welcome to the annual Stanley F. and Auden K. Hampton Memorial Lecture. Stanley Forrest Hampton had a profound impact on the field of clinical allergy and not only on its practice at our institution. He received his undergraduate training at Washington and Lee University, a liberal arts college in Virginia, and his medical degree from the Washington University School of Medicine in 1934. He served in the Army Air Corps in World War II. Dr. Hampton is believed to be the first physician to be certified in the specialty of allergy. He joined the faculty of Washington University in 1940 as the director of the allergy clinic, which he ran and in essence established with Dr. Ironman, also pictured here on the left. He took great pride in training residents and fellows interested in the field. He was also impactful beyond our institution. He was a founding trustee of the Allergy Foundation of America, a national nonprofit organization started to raise money for education and research in our field. This organization morphed into what is now the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, or AFA, a patient organization dedicated to advocacy, education, research, and community support, the St. Louis chapter of which our division actively supports through today. Dr. Hampton served on the Medical Services Committee of the American Academy of Allergy, now called the Quad AI, our prestigious national professional organization. In this capacity, he undertook many projects that established the allergy clinical practice and raised the profile of our specialty. He worked on standardizing diagnostic and therapeutic terminology and greatly expanded coding, nomenclature, and CPT codes for allergy services in the 1960s. These are the codes that we still use today for the clinical services we provide. He also chaired the Academy's Committee on Medical Economics, a group charged with studying the socioeconomic factors which might influence the delivery of high quality medical care in the field of allergy. He investigated ways to improve quality and maintain value. Prescient work in this age of value-based care. He also represented allergy societies to the American Medical Organization, where among other things, he developed screening criteria for asthma for use by hospitals as a means of quality assurance. Work again somewhat ahead of its time with its focus on QI. For all of his exhaustive work and important contributions, Dr. Hampton was given the Distinguished Service Award by our Academy in 1975. He died in 1989 at the age of 81. We honor his memory with this lectureship today, recognizing that our field and clinical practice may be much different if not for all of his efforts. And now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Sarita Patel is a physician scientist at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in human biology with a minor in psychology from Stanford University. She received her medical degree from Duke University during which time she was the recipient of the Howard Hughes Medical Research Fellowship. This is when I first met Dr. Patel working in the lab and it was evident even at that time that she had the intellect, curiosity, and drive to be a leading scientist in our field. After completing her internal medicine residency at the University of Pennsylvania, she joined the Allergy and Immunology Fellowship Program at Massachusetts General Hospital. She has remained on faculty since she graduated in 2012 with appointments in the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics. Her laboratory in the Center for Immunology and Inflammatory Diseases focuses on understanding the antibody and B cell responses in the initiation and treatment of allergic diseases, in particular food allergy. Dr. Patil's work is well funded by several grants from the NIH. She has many publications in high impact journals and has delivered numerous lectures nationally and internationally. She was honored with a named lectureship award at our academy meeting last year. If all this were not enough, Dr. Patil serves in national leadership positions, including as co-chair of the Immune Tolerance Network at the NIAID and vice chair of the 2024 Gordon Research Conference on Food Allergy. 
I'm confident that her work will lead to the next generation of therapies in our field, and I'm so looking forward to her talk today entitled Neutralizing Antibodies in Durable Clinical Responses to Peanut Immunotherapy. Please welcome Dr. Patil. I think I'm mic now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jareth, for such a generous introduction. It has been years, um, a career years in the making, but one that I have thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I hope to take you all along some of the paths that I have traveled um, in our short time together today. Uh, really quickly, I was asked to put up two slides. Um, so this is one of them. I also have no pertinent disclosures um, to, to disclose. So, Today, I have the privilege of talking about antibodies and food allergy. IgE-mediated food allergy is the quintessential antibody-mediated disease where pathogenic IgE antibodies fundamentally drive the clinical manifestations of this disease. Less appreciated, though, has been the protective role of allergen-specific antibodies. And I think that this is a much more complex idea than we previously um, might have had insight to. And today, in our short time together, I really wanted to take everyone through a journey where we kind of explore all of the innovations that have been made on the clinical side in how we induce tolerance and how we think about allergic tolerance are the contributions of how we think about the persistence and the role of IgE memory and bring that all together and put that in the context of how might antibodies play a protective role in uh, allergic tolerance, whether it be acquired through our actually treating patients with immunotherapy or natural and inducing uh, tolerance at a very early age through early introduction of allergenic foods. And then I wanted to take us along a slightly different path where we kind of now think about these mechanisms on a population basis and finally end with how we think that these insights might drive the generation of um, new and novel therapeutics for the treatment of allergy. So food allergy has become an epidemic. Uh, you know, 32 million Americans in the U.S. are affected by food allergy. Billions of dollars are spent on food allergy annually. Um, the rise in food allergy has been unprecedented. In a short 10-year period, the number of ED visits for anaphylaxis to food allergy increased by 400%. My colleagues at MGH put this in a way that I think is very comprehensible. Every three minutes, someone goes to the emergency room for a food allergy reaction. For those of us who are parents, this is woven into our everyday life. 10% of children have food allergies. Every one of us knows a child with food allergies. Every class has about two kids with food allergy in it. So this is something that has pervaded every element of our life um, and continues to grow at an unprecedented rate. And so IgE-mediated food allergy, I said, was the quintessential antibody-mediated allergic disease because very minute exposures to allergen can trigger dramatic life-threatening allergic reactions. When minute exposures to allergen cross-link or activate IgE antibodies that fit on top of allergic effector cells, those allergic effector cells activate and spew out granules full of pro-inflammatory mediators, including those mediators that drive the systemic stereotyped immediate onset reaction that we know as anaphylaxis, that's multi-systemic. And for the longest time, our treatment has really consisted of avoidance, and here's an epinephrine auto-injector in case you do get exposed. And those measures are really not um, adequate to treat some of our most vulnerable populations like children. Now, I'm not trying to overblow um, the idea that, you know, IgE-mediated hypersensitivity induces anaphylaxis because while yes, anaphylaxis occurs often, um, the mortality associated with anaphylaxis, it does occur every year we lose people to anaphylaxis, but the uh, but the mortality that's associated with anaphylaxis is lower than so many other threats to society today, right? So it's lower incident in children than cancer or violence from firearms. And so, you know, it is a serious concern, but that's not the only aspect of food allergy that we have to deal with as clinicians when we're treating food allergy. Because food allergens are present ubiquitously, and because people encounter food allergens on a repeated basis, on a daily basis, 
the sheer number of potential encounters with allergen really drive the personal experience of patients with food allergy. And so their motivations for being treated with food allergy are numerous and, and vary tremendously across the population, but include serious concerns um, like the social isolation that happens from having to avoid food allergens or the anxiety that occurs because food allergens can be hidden in sources that might not be so obvious. There is a considerable amount of concern over nutritional deficiencies that occur, especially in multiple allergic children and adults. This impacts our management of other diseases like diabetes and metabolic disorders. And then finally, you know, it is a humongous hassle and imposition on these patients to have to avoid these foods. And it sometimes also imposes those restrictions on uh, the greater public. And so our field was really driven to try to figure out a way to treat IgE-mediated food allergy. And so we turn to a 100-year-old protocol, the idea of using allergen immunotherapy. And the structure of allergen immunotherapy here is very similar to that that we've used, again, for hundreds of years to treat other types of allergen uh, allergic disorders. So we use a buildup phase where there, are, there is an incremental exposure to increasing doses of allergen under clinical supervision, careful clinical supervision, followed by a maintenance phase, followed by then an evaluation um, of how effective that therapy has been. And in order to interrogate ideas of tolerance, we actually stop the therapy and then we challenge again. So that's been the general concept behind immunotherapy. And the first trials to try to do this with subcutaneous immunotherapy resulted in extremely severe anaphylaxis and they were abandoned. We had never gone back to ever injecting food allergens ever again. And then for a long time, they were small efforts oftentimes um, led in Europe to try to apply these principles of immunotherapy in different types of food allergy. This was followed by um, you know, larger uh, food allergy clinical trials that were designed with placebo controls and randomization and blinded evaluations to increase the rigor of those clinical trials in immunotherapy and quantify the outcomes of immunotherapy. And that led to the final phase three clinical trials in peanut oral immunotherapy that led to the first FDA approved commercial product for peanut oral immunotherapy that was approved a few years ago. And there have been studies in a lot of other ways of delivering antigen, including epicutaneous immunotherapy, as well as um, subligal forms immunotherapy that I won't have time to go into today. But along the way, we've learned a lot. Those early forms of or, uh, oral immunotherapy, we're using high dose allergens with the idea that we're gonna induce a degree of tolerance high enough so that people can eat the allergen on a regular basis. As these clinical trials progressed, it became clear that the goals of therapies need to shift to meet patient needs and expectations. And the general expectations and needs of the population was to have a bite proof tolerance. So the idea was, if you bit into a food that accidentally contained peanut, you could stop after one bite, but you also wouldn't have a life-threatening severe anaphylactic reaction. So that was the concepts that fed into the, de the, the development of this particular clinical trial that led to the FDA approval of that first commercial product. And um, so in this clinical trial, like most clinical trials of oral immunotherapy, they selected those patients with the most severe peanut allergy. So those that are going to react to 100 milligrams of peanut protein or less, which is about a third of a peanut kernel. And then the idea was to build those patients up to be able to tolerate a daily dose of 300 milligrams a day, which is about a peanut kernel every single day. And then evaluate how many of those patients, if you challenge them with peanut, can tolerate the primary endpoint in the study was 600 milligrams. So the idea that you'd have some buffer zone between you know, two kernels of peanut and recognizing that you've had exposure to peanuts, so you'd stop consuming whatever food it was. So, you know, this clinical trial, when they studied younger children from age four to 17, found that about 70% of patients met that primary endpoint of being able to tolerate 600 milligrams of peanut. Now, about 50 of those patients on this clinical trial were adults, and you'll notice the adults didn't meet the primary endpoint. There wasn't any, there wasn't significant difference between placebo and um, peanut oral immunotherapy treated 
um, patients in terms of their ability to tolerate peanut. And this highlights a really important lesson that we've learned over these many years of treating patients with immunotherapy. And that is that oral immunotherapy is oftentimes much more successful in both desensitization as well as induction of tolerance in younger patients than it is in older patients. And this is an idea that we're gonna get back to you again uh, in thinking about how we should implement or what the future therapies for food allergy might be and how we should implement um, therapy. And then the other piece of this is that because we know that most patients don't hold on to tolerance, by the time they did the study, this was clear, that most patients don't hold on to tolerance if you stop their regular ingestion of peanut. And this clinical trial, they said, keep going, just ingest the peanut every single day. And that was the solution to maintain desensitization, which we all know is a temporary state. But what about tolerance, right? What about being able to stop that therapy and evaluate whether people can hold on to their ability to tolerate an allergen without having anaphylaxis. So the higher dose therapies and the, their studies of um, sustained tolerance taught us that about only 20 to 30% of patients after they complete high dose immunotherapy stop ingestion for anywhere from two weeks to three months will hold on to their tolerance. To foods. And this is really illustrated elegantly in this clinical trial performed at Stanford, where they treated, again, highly sensitive patients with high dose oral immunotherapy. So this is 4,000 milligrams, you know, building up to a dose of 4,000 milligrams and maintaining it. And then they did something clever, which is they stopped immunotherapy completely and compared that to just decreasing back to the 300 milligram dosage that we had discussed to see what impact does that have on tolerance. And as we expected, very few people at this juncture, right, after they completely stopped peanut and read here, were able to tolerate peanut around the same rate that we would think, 20 to 30%. But if you maintained a low dose of peanut in people's diet, slightly more people could hang on to tolerance even after you reduce that dose, suggesting that regular ingestion of peanut on a prolonged basis was helping to get us to a more sustained tolerance state. But all of these, um, and this finding about sustained tolerance, I should say, in many other studies, we found that as we march down in age and give oral immunotherapy to younger and younger people, down to preschool toddlers, right? That we can actually induce sustained responses more easily in those young, young children which leads us to the idea of natural tolerance. So in 2015, a now landmark clinical trial in food allergy was done where we evaluated, does early introduction of peanut help induce tolerance, really prevent IgE-mediated hypersensitivity and induce tolerance in otherwise high-risk infants? So these are infants that had so moderate to severe eczema or had egg allergy, and they were randomized to either be fed peanut in this unique immunologically active window of four to six months or not. And in those children who actually got peanut in that time period, their rate of IgE-mediated hypersensitivity at five years dropped by 80%. So early introduction at a very young age of allergen, contrary to the advice that we were giving to our patients at the time, right, really induces or, or promotes tolerance of those allergens and those high risk individuals. And this work has now you know, um, been validated in even children who don't have high risk um, uh, comorbidities for developing IgE media hypersensitivity. And even in those children, the rate of IgE media hypersensitivity significantly decreases so much so that now there are guidelines telling you exactly how to introduce that peanut to your infant to make sure that we get those allergens into the diets of these children early on. And so this is an illustration of a now famous bomba, so like Cheetos covered in peanut flour that you can make into a slurry and feed your children. And it sounds crazy, but let me tell you, the kids love bomba. So back to like the question that, that I'm sure that we're all having in our minds here today, right? Which is that we see adult patients and they have persistent allergy. Why is allergy so persistent, right? This has been a persistent question in the field of food allergy. How do we remember IgE? And there's been some really landmark studies in the last 10 years that have really shed new insight into this idea. Um, this 
for, to, to answer this question, we kind of have to go back to immunology 101 and look at the genetic locus for antibodies, right? And so this is the heavy chain locus of the human uh, immunoglobulin region. So this is a VDJ, this is a FAB region, which we'll get to in just a little bit. And then these are the, the constant regions, right? And all of us are born with, you know, all of our B cells that have these in our germline. So this is the mu, the delta, so the IgM and IgG that we expect to be on the surface of our mature, naive circulating B cells. And then the IgGs and then IgE down here. And what this means is that when we undergo recombination class switch to make antibodies of different flavors, of different constant regions, you can actually have sequential switching meaning that you could go from an IgM to an IgE, but you could also go from an IgG antibody, B cell producing an IgG antibody, to class switch into an IgE producing B cell. And that's highly relevant because that could help us understand why we make such high affinity IgE antibodies. It also solved another problem that most of us that were doing human B cell studies were finding which is that none of us could find IgE positive B cells. They exist, but they're phenomenally rare and hard to identify for a number of reasons I won't belabor today. And then this idea of sequential switching was substantiated with human B cell receptor repertoire studies. So if you take the B cells from allergic patients and you sequence all of their B cell receptors and look, are there similar B cell receptors between these different constant regions, you find that there's a very strong connection between IgG1 and IgE, suggesting that there's sequential switch going on because how else would those you know, variable regions look so similar? And in work that's currently under review, but again, from the same group, Mariela Fay's group, who had established this first in murine models, substantiated by a lot of other human studies, has now turned back to human models and has taken B cells, memory IgG1 positive B cells from peanut allergic patients and shown that those B cells that have the IL-4 receptor are particularly susceptible to being driven to class switch, to sequentially switch to IgE, providing an elegant mechanism in our bodies for what drives a particularly important mechanism for persistent Ig. So our IgG1 pool can feed our IgE memory on a repeated and continual basis. And you know, for all of those who treat allergic individuals, we know that if you block that cascade pharmacologically, would say a medication like dupilumab that blocks IL-4 receptor alpha and therefore blocks IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, you can stop this. We all see the, the decrease that's been now you know, established time and time again in the literature of total IgE. But for those of us that take care of allergic patients with IgE mediated food allergies, they continue to have a small low-lying pool of circulating allergen-specific IgE. And if you challenge those patients, they continue to react, right? And that's also because IgE memory is held in two places. One is in those rare population of IgE-positive plasma cells that have homed into the bone marrow. And the other is of these class sequentially switched cells from the IgG1 population. And in patients who have really high levels of Ig, they have tons of these cells that can keep driving that persistent IgE production over and over again. So how does this information and connection between IgE and IgG help us understand allergic tolerance, right? And in the last, uh, I would say 10 to 15 years, there's been a real focus on allergen-specific T cells. We've had these incredibly um, fine and granular tools to, for the first time, identify allergen-specific T cell subsets that are modulated by immunotherapy. So, for example, allergen-specific Th2 cells have been shown to, you know, be energized and even deleted over the course of immunotherapy by work that was very elegantly done um, by Eric Wambre, Cecilia Barron, and, and Wayne Treffler, and in just one small illustration here is when they use single cell RNA-seq to profile T cells that have been stimulated from the peripheral blood of patients um, with allergen. And then you can look at the activated T cell population by looking at those that upregulate CD-154. Uh, you can see that the Th2 cells over time 
are transcriptionally modulated and they're energized over the course of oral immunotherapy shown here on the uh, x-axis. And this is really exclusive to the TH2 population. When we think about this over time in immunotherapy, what's actually happening? And so in this review, we actually kind of categorize these, this immune progression that happens over the course of immunotherapy into distinct phases. So in the early induction phase, there's actually an explosion of Th2 immunity. The T cells are spewing out their cytokines. So it's actually enhanced um, activity during this time. And we can see that because the IgE levels increase, the, the effector cell reactivity increases. And that all starts to wane during the late induction phase where things start to switch over. So Th2 cells start to become energized. T regulatory cells start to get induced. We now think that's due to IL-2 secretion from um, these allergen-specific Th2 cells um, in work that's recently been published by the Barron Lab. And um, all of this promotes you know, the um, development of IgG4 responses in ways that we don't fully understand yet. And that uh, mechanisms of tolerance get consolidated during this consolidation phase. And what I mean by consolidated is they actually become better established. And so you actually see Th2 a cells at their lowest levels, you see T regulatory cells um, that have now been induced and home to the peripheral tissues, and you see uh, a good um, and strong increase in allergen-specific antibodies. And so one illustration here is this happens across all patients who get oral immunotherapy, whether you're young or you're old, and in this particular um, clinical trial of, of um, uh, immunotherapy in preschool age children, we see that, like we expected, the IgE levels decrease as you undergo immunotherapy. And there is an increase in the IgG4, in this case, they normalized to IgE, but IgG4 levels increase to peanut allergen. And once you stop the regular ingestion of peanut, they fall, right? And this is kind of to be expected. We see this in any kind of antigen specific response. And the important thing here is that. It happens universally in all patients, whether or not you have only transient responses in red or sustained responses in blue, it doesn't matter. Everyone has an equivalent induction of allergen specific IgG, right? Or IgG4 in this case. So if that's the case, well, okay, it might have an important role, but it doesn't seem to have an important role in tolerance or so we thought. But I would bring us all the way back to thinking about the fact that antibodies are fundamentally have two aspects, right? Their FC region that controls their effector function, but also the FAB region and how they interact with the allergen. And so, you know, when we're thinking about this in respect of food allergy, it's not really the whole peanut we're talking about, right? It's actually to individual proteins within that food. Foods are very complex substances. There are many different kinds of molecules that are here. And proteins tend to be the largest or most common source of allergens and the way we define these allergens over time is just empirically, we've looked at those proteins that tend to bind to serum IgE and allergic individuals. And in peanut, and I use this illustration because really it's one of the places where we use this very um, commonly clinically to really as a, as a diagnostic fine tuning, tuning tool. It turns out that you can make IgE to many different allergens. All of these allergens up here um, are known to induce IgE responses, of course, but ERA-H2, which is a 2S albumin, is a seed storage protein that provides nitrogen and fuel for the seed, for, for the peanut kernels. That is the most immunodominant and clinically relevant of all of these different allergens. And so large clinical studies were done uh, looking at levels of ERA-H2 IgE and their clinical relevance. So correlating this to what our gold standard in food allergy, which was actually food challenge, feeding the patient the allergen that we think they're allergic to and actually seeing if they have a reaction. And you can see here that the ERA-H2 IgE level is extremely sensitive and specific for diagnosing peanut allergy. And this is true in the general population, but it's also true in those really, really young infants that we were thinking about introducing peanut to, right? It turns out that ERA-H2 specific IgE is a really good biomarker for clinical reactivity. So clearly, antibody responses to era H2 might be highly relevant to our understanding of um, peanut allergy. And so if you look at antibodies to this immunodominant allergen and look at the uh, kinetics of these serum antibodies over time in oral immunotherapy in a high dose clinical trial of oral immunotherapy as we did here, you can see what we the patterns that we've previously come to expect, right? 
So era H2 specific IgE rises and then falls in all patients who undergo oral aminotherapy. The levels of era H2 specific IgE are higher in those patients that only have transient responses in red compared to those that have sustained responses in blue. That's what we would expect. And we've seen that pretty consistently. And then you have the induction of allergen specific IgG and IgG4 uniformly in all patients who go under, undergo immunotherapy, regardless of whether they have sustained responses or only transient responses. So again, this question is, are they just an epiphenomena? Maybe they play a role, but maybe they're not relevant in tolerance. The idea that antibodies, IgG antibodies induced in immunotherapy have the ability to suppress allergic responses is rooted in literature that dates all the way back to 1954, when Robert Cook had to do complex fractionations to measure the amount of IgG antibodies induced in immunotherapy shown here on the x-axis. And then using end skin prick titration, he mixed the serum from those patients before and after immunotherapy and skin tested with it to show that skin test responses were suppressed with post-immunotherapy serum. Not something I can do today, but that gave us important information about the fact that these antibodies that are induced by immunotherapy are really suppressing allergic effector function in an important way. So that was the basis of our understanding of it. But even though I can't do this endpoint skin pick titration, I do have more sophisticated tools to look at effector cell modulation over immunotherapy today. And so we turn to using basophils. So basophils are a rare circulating granule site. Fortunately for us, they're in the peripheral blood. And they carry the IgE repertoire on their surface. And so in a test tube, you can actually stimulate them with allergen and see if they can activate. When they activate, they upregulate a molecule called CD63 on the surface, so we can measure that by flow cytometry. And when we activate basophils with increasing doses of allergen, you get a beautiful dose response curve, right? And this dose response curve has two really important aspects. One is how high does the dose response curve go? So that's reactivity, and you can quantify it by that by measuring the area under the dose response curve. Or the sensitivity, how much allergen does it take to activate the basophil, right? And those two measures tell us very different things about the immune system. So in the first instance, we looked at um, basophil reactivity over time in this high dose clinical trial of oral immunotherapy, comparing those patients with only transient responses in red to those who had more sustained responses in blue. And we found, just like we've seen in every other clinical trial that's measured basophil reactivity, that there is a suppression of basophil reactivity over time with oral immunotherapy. And that occurs consistently throughout the buildup stage. And even, um, and you see a little bit of a rebound as the allergen uh, concentration is held stable in this maintenance phase. And then when you stop allergen uh, exposure in this gray bar, only those patients who had transient responses had a return of their basophil reactivity. In other words, basophil reactivity to era H2 specifically mirrored clinical reactivity. And those patients who had sustained responses, their basophil reactivity remained suppressed. On the other hand, basophil sensitivity was, was fascinating. It showed us a completely different picture, which is that the amount of allergen it took us to stimulate the basophils increased over time, but only in those patients who had sustained responses. And that stayed persistent even after they stopped allergen uh, ingestion which meant that this tracked with their ability to have sustained tolerance. So what was going on here was the question. It turns out that we can reduplicate this if we use serum from these patients with either transient or sustained responses. So it's something in the serum that's driving it, right? And it's not just in the case of acquired tolerance through immunotherapy. If you look at natural tolerance, we again see that these IgG antibodies are important in suppressing effector cell function. So in this work done by Alex Santos, she looked at um, serum from patients who were peanut allergic, so they had IgE and they were allergic to peanut and shown in dark red, or those that were just sensitized to peanut. They had IgE, but they didn't actually have clinical reactivity if you challenged them with peanut. And using a LAD2 cell line, which is a mast cell-like cell line, she saw that you could induce degranulation with serum from peanut allergic patients, but not with those patients that had um, you know, sensitization. But if you took that serum from patients who had sensitization and you depleted the IgG out, reactivity would recur. So that would tell us that there is a suppressive effect of allergen-specific IgG, not only in acquired tolerance, but also in natural tolerance. So how does that work? 
right? And so, you know, we had this theory that the structural ability of antibodies to recognize antigen might have a functional impact on how they might work. In other words, if you have antibodies that are induced by immunotherapy, for example, or natural tolerance, and they're able to sequester allergen away, disrupt the ability of that allergen to bind and cross-link IgE, you might have a better chance of having suppressed effector cell function, right? Not having degranulation versus in those patients who have only transient responses, they don't have as um, effective of an antibody response that's sequestering or preventing that cross-linking um, from going on. So how do you study this? So everything that we knew about how allergens and antibodies interact really came from peptide microarray data. So here you take the sequence of ARHC, you chop it into a bunch of peptides, and you look at if serum IgE can bind to these individual peptides, right? And this is work that was spearheaded by Wayne Schreffler when he was working with Hugh Sampson at Mount Sinai. And you know you can see that there's a humongous diversity in the number of peptides that can be recognized by individual patients with peat allergy. And if you look at this over the course of oral immunotherapy, and here in this clinical trial is of high-dose oral immunotherapy, they looked at responses before and after immunotherapy in the IgE and the IgG4 compartments. And you can see that there is a mirroring effect, right? That IgE and IgG, when it comes to era H2, are recognizing similar areas of, of, of era H2 on a peptide or sequential epitope basis. And when I say sequential epitopes, you know, you can imagine your area H2 molecule with these kind of peptide regions localized all over that molecule. But I would ask you, you know, the one really funny thing about this question is that if there is mirroring, then we understand that antibodies are, are sequestering allergen away, but that must be on a one-to-one -one molar basis, right? So holding that in mind and now switching back to natural tolerance, Natural tolerance tells us something even more interesting, right? It can tell us how these antibody responses evolve in patients who will have allergy or not. So in this LEAP cohort, remember these high-risk infants, they were randomized to either getting peanut or not getting peanut. So they were either avoiding it or consuming it. And in those patients that avoided peanut, they had a rise in era h specific IgE levels. And when you did more sophisticated versions of peptide microarray, you could find that those patients we're able to recognize peptides on era H2 fairly early on. And that epitope response just diversified so that then they could recognize not just era H2, but also era H1, 2, and 3. Compared to those patients that consumed peanut, didn't really have any epitope, sequential epitope specific IgE recognition. And then if you turn to IgG4, you find that almost everyone kind of universally recognizes these peptides across the entire. Um, uh, region of, of era H2. What this data and the data from oral immunotherapy doesn't do, or where there's this big black box that's missing, is a conformational epitope recognition, right? Here you can look at very compact regions of era H2 that are being recognized using these peptide methodologies, but you really don't know the primary way that antibodies recognize allergen, which is using conformational epitopes. So back in 2015, I created a fluorescent multimer that identified rare circulating era H2 specific B cells with high specificity so I could clone them out on a single cell basis and clone their recombinant antibodies. And the idea was that we could then use these recombinant antibodies and start to understand the connection um, between these antibodies and their functional ability uh, to suppress allergic responses. And after a seven year collaboration that I will talk about in, in a lot more detail in the next hour, um, we were able to actually identify the conformational epitopes of era H2 using X-ray crystallography and found that there were three big main regions on era H2 that are recognized by antibodies. So each one of these structures here are FABs from different monoclonal recombinant era H2 antibodies. And this is the era H2 molecule um, inside. And you can see that it's a compact molecule composed of alpha helices. And it's very springy nature was the reason that no one could actually X-ray crystal uh, uh, do analysis with X-ray crystallography. So what we ended up doing was using two clinical trials of peanut oral immunotherapy in both children and adults and selected patients who had either sustained responses in gray or transit responses in black. 
honed out a cache of about 80 era H2 specific recombinant antibodies from those patients to study their functionality. Using X-ray crystallography and bilayer interferometry, we were able to bin these or recognize where on era H2 they bound. And we realized that there were some antibodies that were only from patients who had sustained response to immunotherapy that recognize the allergen in unique ways. That is to say that where they recognize their confirmation epitope recognition of era H2 sat on era H2 in such a way that it overlapped with sequential epitope recognition at the same time, which meant that for every single one of these, what we called neutralizing antibodies, they could not only block other IgE antibodies from recognizing a confirmational epitope, but also antibodies from recognizing those sequential epitopes. So on a per molar basis, you now had antibodies that were much more effective than other antibodies, which could explain that as after immunotherapy IgG levels drop, you still have antibodies that could effectively disrupt that IgE allergen interaction and promote tolerance in those patients we know clinically have sustained tolerance. An elegant demonstration of this, well, I think it is an elegant demonstration of this, is we put ERA H2 down and use a competitive direct ELISA where we saturate that ERA H2 with a monoclonal antibody that recognized a particular epitope of ERA H2 and then looked at how much that monoclonal antibody sitting on ERA H2 could inhibit serum Ig from penoallergic patients from binding. And when we did that, we found that when that monoclonal antibody recognized a conformational epitope, it inhibit a significantly greater amount of IgE being able to bind to era H2 than if that antibody recognized a sequential epitope. And I'll go into more molecular details um, again in the next hour, but it's all been defined on a, on, a, on a very precise basis. So the last question was, does this explain affect your cell function? So we turned back to our friends, the basophils, took basophils from a donor, stripped off their endogenous IgE, loaded up peanut-specific IgE from peanut allergic patients, a pool of peanut allergic patients. And then we stimulated those basophils with era H2 that was pre-complex with either a control antibody or a mixture of antibodies that we thought would mimic an IgG mixture from patients with either transient or sustained responses. And so as we expect, if you just stimulate these basophils with era H2 and a control antibody, you get great degranulation shown here in black. But when you use any kind of era H2 specific antibody, you can decrease the activation of those effector cells. But when you use neutralizing antibodies, you can significantly decrease that, that activation further, which again, substantiates or closes the loop here on this idea that neutralizing antibodies can effectively disrupt Ig allergen interactions and drive uh, more sustained versions of tolerance. In the course of this work, we stumbled on something that we hadn't expected. So, um, and that was uh, that an idea that's called antibody conversions. And, and so, you know, going back again to Immunology 101, we're not going to talk about how the antigen and antibody actually interact. They interact at the tips of the antibody, right, where you have these complementary determining regions that make contact with the actual allergen itself. And, you know, all of us sitting in this room, we all have different alleles for our B cell receptors to scramble together. And then each one of us is going to get exposed to different antigens. And each one of us has B cells and antibodies that are going to undergo affinity maturation and drop mutations along that B cell receptor pathway to make different kinds of antibodies, right? And so we would expect that our B cell receptor antibody repertoires are very distinct. And in fact, they've done studies on this. If you take identical twins and you compare the B cell receptor repertoires, right, they're, they're individual, they're distinct. And yet we found evidence of conversion antibodies, antibodies that had very similar sequences and recognized allergens in very stereotyped ways. And so back in 2015, this ended up being actually an accident of the way that I analyzed our data. In 2015, I was looking at using era H2 specific B cell receptor sequences and fishing out similar sequences from deep sequencing repertoires so that I could study like the entire compendium, right? Of era H2 B cell receptor sequences. And when we did that, we found that an individual era H2 specific B cell sequence could, could have uh, related sequences, highly homologous sequences, not only on the sequence level, but even in the characteristics of their amino acids across these complementary determining regions where they contact the allergen. This was happening in completely unrelated patients, right? Which, so we published this as antibody convergence. And it wasn't clear at the time why that would be happening. Since then, numerous other cohorts 
have established this phenomena to occur as well. So for example, this very elegant study done by Scott Boyd over at Stanford, they, they took gut biopsies from peanut allergic patients and looked at the B cells in those gut biopsies. And sure enough, they found sequences that we had previously identified at ARAH2 specific B cell sequences in the guts of patients who have peanut allergy. So again, an uh, um, a illustration of antibody convergence. And in our most recent paper, we defined epitope basis of these converging antibodies. So here we took sequences that recognize epitope 1.1 and epitope 1.2. And as you can see in epitope 1.1 here, these are all sequences that came from different patients, but their heavy and light chain complementary determining regions look highly homologous. We know we've established experimentally that they recognize the allergen in the same way. And so this idea that completely unrelated people are making antibodies that recognize allergen in the same way, that's very odd, right? And this is, this is again, been established as epitope 1.2, similar sequences um, were found in Derek Krutz's cohort, again, from a, a separate cohort from Stanford, where he was looking at IgE positive B cell receptors. And again, you see public sequences there too. And the striking thing about this particular sequence is that it's a very long CDR3, right? These CDR3s are hitting the lengths of like neutralizing HIV antibody like CDR3s. And so it's telling us that there's something very unique driving antibody recognition, not only on an individual basis, but on a population basis. So what does that mean? That means that the things that we're studying and the antibodies that we're studying have meaning not only for the individual patients we're studying it from, but from, you know, for all peanut allergic patients. And so we can design ways to disrupt those interactions. So in this collaboration um, uh, with Jeffrey Mueller and Lars Peterson, who also did the crystal structure um, uh, work with us, they were able to surgically, I call it surgically, precisely make six mutations in era H2, preserving the 3D structure of era H2, preserving the ability of other antibodies to bind to era H2. And then we tested, can this disrupt IgE interactions? And so to do that, we used a model of passive cutaneous anaphylaxis where we took a mouse that had human FC epsilon R1 knocked in so that we can load up their ears interdermally with serum from peanut allergic patients and then challenge these mice IV with allergen to look at vasodilation as a measure of anaphylaxis and look at dye extravasation. So we use a blue dye, dye extravasation into the ears. And when we do that, we find that challenging with the mutant allergen significantly decreases activation and therefore vasodilation in these mice. So now we can design hypoallergens based on this knowledge uh, to literally shape how uh, immune responses and how antibody responses develop to these allergens in a meaningful way. So taking all of this together, I think that these, these um, new molecular insights to how antibodies and antigens interact are really gonna help change some of our approaches or our thinking around mechanisms of immunology, number one. And so they've really kind of already changed how we think about allergic tolerance, and maybe they'll also change how we think about sensitization to allergens. It also changes our perspective on the idea of early immune plasticity, right? This idea that we have these immunologic windows where we can induce tolerance. is suggesting that these mechanisms of allergen recognition may play an important role in how the natural tolerance is induced in patients. It also tells us something about persistence of allergy, right? And gives us new insights into how IgE uh, and IgG memory play a really important role in inducing these um, uh, allergic and tolerant phenotypes that we see. On a clinical basis, we have an unprecedented opportunity to look at how immunomodulator use with immunotherapy might be able to change outcomes to immunotherapy. But what we now need is a better way of prognosticating who needs those therapies and how we're gonna do it, right? And so this suite of tools might provide new insights into allowing us to personalize these approaches much better and to select them at age appropriate times to intervene um, in, in patients who have food allergy. And finally, you know, the therapies in food allergy um, have been increasing at an, an unprecedented rate, but I think that there's a lot that we can learn from trying to use these antibodies as passive immunization agents to kind of see what impact that has immunologically. 
Of course, this work can lead to the development of hypoallergens and not just hypoallergens to abrogate IgE binding, but maybe even hypoallergens to promote tolerance in unique ways to be combined with immunotherapy. And then I can't forget the fact that these new insights in IgE positive B cells might give us new tools for how we think about modulating IgE over the course of a lifetime in patients. And so today we've kind of taken this long and somewhat complex journey through understanding uh, how IgE and allergens interact, the innovations that have been made clinically in implementing immunotherapy and immunotherapy-like approaches for the induction of tolerance in patients, and then understanding how molecular epitope-peritope interactions can teach us how durable tolerance might be sustained in patients with IgE-mediated allergy, and then how all of that might be able to shape how we treat food allergy in the future. And so um, with that, you know, I've had this incredible journey and I owe the deepest gratitude to a really phenomenal group of people who've worked um, with me on this, on this, on these projects over the years. A lot of the work that um, I showed today was spearheaded by a very talented allergy and immunology um, fellow in my lab named Dr. Nicole LaHood. She was joined by Dr. Thurin Kiswani, who did a lot of the ELISAs and the um, uh, and the uh, effector cell function assays along with the murine models. The um, crystal structure data and insights were um, done by a very talented and dedicated postdoc named Jun Kim Min in uh, Jeffrey and Lars Peterson's lab at the NIEHS. We also have had incredibly fruitful con uh, collaborations with Hayesbrook and Anna who contributed to a lot of the work. Um, and then, you know, last but not least, we owe a debt of gratitude to Wayne Shreffler's lab, from whom all the clinical samples came from, and Chris Love's lab, who lent his single cell expertise many, many years ago. And so with that, from my lab to you, we say thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really great talk. I think we have some unexplored questions. In the back. Thank you very much for this incredible talk. Uh, you know, all of the people that you talked to in this incredible class. It said to me that happiness meditation and the practice of the combination of our group together is that's why I'm going to do this. So um, I'm just going to echo back the question, see if I have it right. The question is really about affinity maturation and sequential class switch recombination and whether there's a role for affinity maturation or what the role is in that, in that connection. Did I understand? I'm so sorry, excuse me. I had a frog in my throat, it's croaking. Um, so the question is, you know, what is the epitope specificity of uh, implications of the sequential class switching as well? I think that's an amazingly interesting question. So to back up, I, I did emit a lot of data from this presentation, including the idea that, you know, oral immunotherapy, we've shown evidence of uh, that it induces affinity maturation of memory IgG cells, right? And that's an important concept because it's those memory IgG cells that are also shooting off sequentially switched IgE positive B cells. And so in that sequential switch, when we think about that, um, and there's new data actually from Australia that kind of suggests that affinity maturation class switch recombinations, they don't occur at the same place and they're not molecularly actually driven by the same uh, mechanisms either. They're actually separate. And so the idea is that you have this affinity matured IgG1 epitope specific B cell that can then switch to an IgE that makes the same epitope specific you know, IgE as the IgG was. And so, and this idea of sequential switch and the idea that I was trying to introduce in, the, in this was, it led everyone to think that the, what was actually happening was a mirroring, right? That you would have these sequentially switched IgE, but look, we already have the IgG to the same piece. And so is tolerance really driven by a mismatch in that, right? Or, or is it just sort of an epiphenomena that just because you shoot them off, you always have the IgG to block them as well, and it's not important, you know? Um, and I think that's where the neutralizing antibodies shift to that balance, right? But because they can block 
unique epitopes, all of a sudden, you know, that mirroring is not the most important piece. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a really great question. I, I always like thinking about that. Mm -hmm. This is my pet theory. Um, I don't talk about this in public very often because I think that um, the evidence isn't there yet. But, oh, I'm so sorry. The question that, as, as I understood it, is what is the influence of, you know, the widespread use of antibiotics on the induction of, of IgE-mediated hypersensitivity? Um, so there's a couple of ways to answer that, right? Like there, we're cur there are currently several large birth cohorts that are now being designed specifically to answer this question about the effect of just the epidemiologic association between antibiotic use and IgE-mediated hypersensitivity. But of course, we all know that you know, C-section is, for example, a risk factor for the development of IgE-mediated hypersensitivity, and that's, of course, mediated by changes in, in gut microbiomes, right? Um, but what is there a more direct connection between these other than, because we've assumed for the longest time that you know, antibiotic use not only changes the gut microbiome, but that change in the gut microbiome impacts T regulatory subsets that you know, um, populate the infant gut. And we've assumed that the immune cell plasticity that we think about at early life is related to the modulation of those T cells. I actually have an alternate explanation, which is that, um, and this is all work that we're working on currently right now in the lab, so I don't even have the end results. But if we're right about conversion antibodies, and it turns out these conversion antibodies use some of the most commonly rearranged VJ gene alleles that are seen in mucosal immune responses, then it's possible that there is a connection between mucosal or commensal antibody responses and the induction of allergen-specific antibodies, right? And antibiotics would directly impact that. I don't know if that's true yet. We'll see. You any questions? That's like the billion dollar question. Yeah, I think I think early immune plasticity is fascinating, right? Because you know, that time period, so, so there's a couple of really interesting things that we learned from the clinical implementation of early introduction, right? Which is that four to six month window is actually really seriously a four to six month window. The further you march out from that window and reintroduce peanut, I'm sorry, I should have repeated the question. The question was, um, uh, yeah, that how can we extend early immune plasticity? What, what is it driven by? And so, you know, my answer to that would be that, you know, that that window is a real immunological window, right? Like the further, as I would say, the further we march out from that window and reintroduce peanut, the higher the likelihood that that patient is going to have a reaction to peanut and isn't going to be able to introduce peanut into their diet. And we also know that that plasticity, that plasticity is somewhat fluid, right? If you successfully early introduce peanut and then you don't continue ingestion, you still run the risk of developing ig mediated hypersensitivity. We've seen that time and time again, right? So just speaking as a clinician now and our, our experience with this as we all have now in this room. So um, the idea that there's something really unique in that time period is fascinating. There are a couple of other really immunologically fascinating things about that time period that I think are relevant here, including the fact that this is the time period where infants are transitioning, right, from um, breast milk or formula to more solid food introduction. And so it's a time of really active microbiome turnover as well. And that we know that there are, um, and we know that that antibody antigen immune complexes, at least in mirroring models, are really important for inducing T regular subsets. This is work that comes out of Talal Chatila and um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting your first name, but Oyoshi, who's now at MGH's labs, right? That this breast milk complexes of allergen antibodies help induce T regulatory subsets in, in the gut again. And so, you know, can we leverage that plasticity? Can we even understand it on a molecular basis? Um, can we 
can we somehow harness it to induce tolerance more effectively in older patients? You know, I, those are all really open questions. I don't think we, we know that. But the reason that I said that I think antibodies have a bigger role is that we really focus on the T cell side of things, right? But if you look carefully at all the data that we have on antibody recognition, that's a really dynamic time for a change in antibody recognition from confirmational epitope recognition to sequential epitope recognition, right? And so again, I think there is, there is more there to kind of uncover and dissect. Um, and until we know how that works, I don't think we're gonna be able to leverage it effectively. That's not to say that we're not trying, right? All of these new therapies, the oral immunotherapy to try to use biologics or immunomodulators are really driven at that question, really. Can we turn the clock back? Can we seal up the, um, the leakiness of the gut, right? Can we, can we improve the epithelial gut barrier and somehow change the way the antigens are recognized by the immune system and therefore promote sustained responses to immunotherapy? Can we do this with blockade of cytokines? Can we do this with anti-IG blockade? The answer to the first two is no, but we're trying all these different kinds of therapies to see if we can do that, but we're attacking the problem in both directions, you know, trying to understand the mechanism immunologically and then trying as clinicians to also uh, make those improvements based on our theories of sensitization and tolerance. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you.